This is BBC One. Now the BBC News with Hugh Edwards at Westminster and Sophie Rayworth in the studio. In order that unity can be maintained, I have decided that I will relinquish the office of Speaker. With those words, Michael Martin becomes the first Speaker for more than three centuries to be forced to stand down. His terse statement follows widespread criticism of his handling of the expenses scandal. As Westminster took in the news, party leaders agreed immediate measures to limit MPs' expenses. Westminster cannot operate like some gentleman's club where the members make up the rules and operate them among themselves. This parliament has sat for too long. Its members have lost touch. Its government is completely paralyzed. We're in the middle of a terrible recession. We need a fresh start. The way to get that is through a general election. We'll have all the details and the reaction to the speaker's resignation. We'll also be asking how far the reforms are likely to go. Also on tonight's program, under surveillance years before he led the 7-7 terror plot, but MI5 were too stretched to keep tabs on him. Is America's love affair with the gas guzzler over? President Obama gets tough with car emissions. And meet Ida, our most distant relative, the 47 million year old fossil that's got the scientists excited. On BBC London, Bill Clinton backs the billion pound regeneration of Elephant and Castle. And stretching the thin blue line, why it's cost eight million pounds to police the Tamil protests in Parliament Square. Very good evening from Westminster, where for the first time in more than three centuries, the Speaker of the House of Commons has been forced to stand down. Michael Martin has faced intense criticism over his handling of the expenses crisis. He will leave on June the 21st. After the statement, he met with party leaders and they agreed drastic new limits on what MPs can claim from now on. The Prime Minister says that the Commons can no longer operate like a gentleman's club. First tonight, our political editor Nick Robinson on the day's events. It is rare for the Commons to gather in near silence. There again it is more than 300 years since a speaker was forced from office. Order, order. Since I came to this house 30 years ago I've always felt that the house is at its best when it is united. In order that unity can be maintained, I have decided that I will relinquish the office of Speaker on Sunday, 21st of June. This will allow the House to proceed to elect a new Speaker on Monday, 22nd of June. That is all I have to say in this matter. Order. That was that. No explanations no farewells. Michael Martin had bowed to the inevitable in a speech lasting just over 30 seconds. Business went on. Mr Speaker, the whole House will respect your wish that we proceed with our business today. We shall make our tributes at a later date. As the Foreign Secretary spoke, MPs queued to shake the Speaker by the hand, and one insisted that this was the time to pay tribute to him. The Foreign Secretary would care to join with me in paying the warmest possible tribute to you, sir, and thanking you for your service to this House and to this country over many years. A very honourable service. But the dissent was in black and white. 23 MPs from all main parties had signed a motion of no confidence in him and the number looks set to grow. On the walls of the corridor leading to the Chamber of the House of Commons are tableaus setting out great scenes from parliamentary history. They may now have to add another. 19th of May 2009, the Speaker, forced from office. It followed a series of misjudgments. In March 2008, the Speaker was involved in a vain attempt to protect MPs from freedom of information requests. In November, he was forced to explain why the police had been allowed to search the MP, Damien Green's office. I was not told that the police did not have a warrant. 
But it was last week's attack on MPs who criticised him. It's easy to say to the press... And a confused performance in the Commons yesterday that convinced many that his time was up. Uh, it's the remaining order on the, uh, the remaining orders. After witnessing that performance, the Prime Minister told the Speaker he could no longer resist calls for a debate about removing him. His fate was sealed. This afternoon, Gordon Brown announced a plan to end the era of the Commons behaving as a gentleman's club. First, though, he praised the man who's just been running it. Let me, first of all, pay tribute to the Speaker for 30 years of public service to his constituency, uh, 20 years as an official of the House, a record of public service of which he and his family should be proud. I think it was, in the end, uh, the right thing for him to do um, because, obviously, he'd lost um, the confidence of the House of Commons. Um, but what we need is not just a new Speaker, we need a new Parliament. We need people to have the chance, in a general election, to pass judgment on their politicians. Michael Martin was understandably proud that a Glaswegian sheet metal worker had risen to one of the highest offices in the land. His friends say, though, he was the victim of prejudice. It's partly class, it's partly uh, uh, the fact he's the first Catholic speaker since the Reformation. I think some people have had it in for him right from the start. I'd like to make a statement for the second time today. <laughs> Tonight, after chairing a meeting of all Westminster's party leaders, the speaker was able to announce agreement on reforms to MPs' allowances. We have today agreed a robust set of interim measures which will take effect at once. Order, I'll pass you over to the deputy. Thank you. If only he must have thought, I'd tried this before. Nick Robinson, BBC News, Westminster. Well, as we've heard there from Nick, the expenses scandal is now leading to some radical changes. The Prime Minister announced today that any Labour MP who'd broken the rules could be barred from standing at the next election. And on the Conservative side, the senior MP Douglas Hogg, who's been criticised for his claims, announced that he wouldn't be standing again. Carol Walker looks at the likely reforms ahead. I have to have two homes. This is the Conservative MP whose moat came to symbolise all that's wrong with the expenses system. Consequently, the cleaning and the maintenance and the, over and the looking after has to be done by somebody. In fact, Douglas Hogg denied he'd ever claimed for his moat to be cleaned, but today he announced he'll stand down at the next election. In future, MPs will not have the luxury of choosing the time of their own departures. The MPs Elliot Morley and David Chater, said to have claimed for mortgages they've paid off, are suspended from the Labour Party and new rules mean they could be barred from standing for Parliament again. That could apply to the Luton South MP Margaret Moran, who claimed £22,000 for dry rot treatment to her partner's home in Southampton. And there's new pressure on Cabinet Minister Hazel Blears, who's repaying £13,000 from the profit on the sale of her flat. Hazel Blears has paid the uh, money back. She has uh, not broken the law and she's not broken the rules of the House of Commons. Uh, it is unacceptable behaviour and she has accepted it is unacceptable behaviour. His latest big idea is a new independent commission to take over MPs' pay, allowances and discipline, ending the cosy self-regulation of Parliament. Westminster cannot operate like some gentleman's club where the members make up the rules and operate them among themselves. If MPs continue to set their own codes and rules, however objectively they try to do so, the public will always question the transparency and the standards that they rightly demand. Last time Gordon Brown met opposition leaders, it ended in bad-tempered disagreement. But at tonight's meeting here, chaired by the outgoing speaker, they did at least agree an outline of sweeping reforms which will mean big changes to the lives and lifestyles of MPs. New rules on MPs' expenses will include a ban on MPs flipping their second home to boost their allowances, no claims for furniture, cleaning or gardening, a limit of £1,200 a month for mortgage or rent and all expenses to be published online. 
No, I think we do need to change the regulatory system. I've been arguing for the, all these changes we need to make, but the Prime Minister's locking out the public. He's, he's behaving as if he's just running this gentleman's club. What we need to do is ask people to be involved. The days of MPs being judge and jury of their own pay, judge and jury of their own expenses are over. That the authority for the House of Commons, for the Houses of Parliament, to run their own expenses system is ended and we now need to move towards a system of complete independence. There is much still to be settled, but another dramatic day here has brought an agreement which could change the way this historic institution is run and perhaps start to lift the dark shadow on its reputation. Carol Walker, BBC News, Westminster. Well, just across the way from me in the central lobby of the Palace of Westminster is our political editor, Nick Robinson. Nick, we'll come to the reforms in a second, but on the speaker, first of all, underline for us the significance of what's happened here today. Well, it was hugely significant, not just because it hasn't happened for hundreds of years, but because he's the symbol of parliamentary authority. I believe it was inevitable, Hugh, that he had to go, because the words used by one MP in his defence, Frank Dobson said, all the poor man tried to do is represent the view of the majority of the House of Commons. That is a defence of him. It also damns him, though, because the gap between the Commons and the public was so great, merely representing what MPs wanted, merely defending their system of allowances, opposing moves to freedom of information, failing to apologise earlier, failing to tell MPs that they had to change. That, in the end, meant he symbolised the problem and, in the end, meant that he was one who had to go. As you were saying, he's been meeting the party leaders this evening. They've come up with some reforms. How important are they? Well, it's clear that the interim reforms that are now being introduced before we get those recommended by an independent inquiry would have avoided many of the problems, many of the controversies that we've seen in recent days. There is also agreement in principle, though not in the detail, about the substance of the uh, Prime Minister's idea that this place stop regulating itself, stop setting its own pay and its own conditions, and that is done e externally. I have to say, though, Hugh, having covered this story now for many months, indeed a couple of years, there is one thing that has exposed the Commons to this. There is one thing that has brought about change and reform, that is transparency. Information has proved once again to be power. Once people knew what was going on here, they forced change. Nick, thanks very much. Nick Robinson there. We'll be back with Nick uh, before the end of the programme. More from Westminster then, when we'll also be considering who's likely to run for the position of Speaker. But for now, back to you, Sophie. Thank you. Thank you very much. Back now to our top story, and Hugh is at Westminster. Hugh. Sophie, thank you very much. And uh, throughout the past few weeks, MPs have been stressing the importance of regaining the trust of the voters. A new system of claiming expenses, of course, will be part of that. And the new speaker, whoever he or she may be, will play a crucial part in uh, sorting that out. The names of possible contenders are already being discussed. John Pienaar has been considering some of the names. The place looks the same, grand, even majestic, but will it ever be the same again? Trust, lost, respect, gone. MPs admit their standing couldn't be any lower. Who'd want to be an MP just now, let alone speaker, after a day Parliament would rather forget but never will? It's a historic day for Parliament. No speaker has been removed for over 300 years and it's a symbol of the crisis now affecting the House of Commons which the new speaker has to deal with very radically and very rapidly. So what's the betting? Who'll be next into the least comfortable seat at Westminster? Labour's Frank Field is certainly independent enough, too maverick maybe for the Labour's taste. Tory Sir George Young, the bicycling baronet, respected, a strong runner. Alan Beath of the Lib Dems has certainly been touring the studios, but Deputy Speaker Alan Hazelhurst from the Tory side would normally be an early favourite, though he was mentioned in the list of controversial claimants. And so was Min Campbell, former Lib Dem leader, who may be rated if there's a mood to look beyond the main parties. Whoever wins will need to appeal to the man and woman in the streets and not just MPs. But as impossible jobs go, there's plenty of competition. Hot competition. And the MP, who gets the support of more than half their colleagues in Westminster's first secret ballot, could also turn out to be Labour's third speaker in a row. The difficult bit will be presiding over a House of Commons people see as their own, not some exclusive London club. Getting rid of the speaker is a first step. It doesn't solve the problems. They've got to solve the problem obviously, of MPs' allowances, 
And I think that will be addressed fairly radically in the next few weeks. But more than that, the whole culture of politics has to change if voters are to be impressed. He can say that again, though most people are putting it more simply. He's probably made some mistakes in the past, um, so it's probably going to be nice to get someone in afresh and hopefully now take this forward. I don't think all the blame should be put on him. I think the whole lot of them are a shower. They're all uh, feathering their own nests, aren't they? Well, they're not all feathering their nests in there, but it looks like it to a lot of people, and that's the problem. MPs expect that the mood of public rage will still be running hot when people vote, many for extreme or fringe parties, or just stay at home in next month's local and European elections. It'll take a long time, and a lot more than a new speaker and a new set of rules, before people feel that their parliament is again half as impressive as it looks. John Pienaar, BBC News, Westminster. Well, Nick Robinson, our political editor, has made his way across from the central lobby. Nick, a new speaker, new expenses system, eventually. Is that going to repair the damage? Well, there are a few here at Westminster who believe that it will. There are many who fear that it won't here because they sense that the voters are not really interested in what happens in the future. They're still interested in getting justice and retribution, if you like, for the past. And that's why we're already seeing deselections on hitherto uh, unseen terms. We are seeing MPs retiring. We're seeing talk of independent candidates running. And we are beginning to see more and more insistent calls for a general election as well. A sense that the voters want to have their say. They don't want, don't want to simply watch as the politicians decide how to correct things about what went wrong in the past. Because at the heart of this, the foundation of this whole crisis in recent weeks has been a simple thing. A gap between what the men and women in the building behind me think is reasonable and what the public think is reasonable. Nick, thank you very much. Nick Robinson there. And that is it from Westminster on the day the Speaker was forced to stand down. There's more national and international news on the BBC News Channel. Right now we can join our news teams where you are. Good night. <laughs>